Well, good morning to everyone. Hopefully you've had a, a fantastic uh, weekend so far. And, you know, oh, they took it down. What happened to my lyrics I had up here? To that song. Uh, I like that, that bridge. You've changed me, but you're still changing me, right? And that's the whole... That's the whole purpose of the Word of God in the relationship with God through Christ Jesus is the ongoing change in our lives. It's called sanctification. It's the process which God uses to separate us for His good work through the changing of our lives by the power of His Word. And I pray and I pray and I pray that that would be the case in your life as a believer that God's word would change you. You know, as the word says, being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I could only, you know, as, I, as we're doing those worship songs, I was like, you know, thinking about just, just you know, how God gives us his word and he speaks to us through his Holy Spirit. And sometimes that, you know, we capture things in our heart in that moment. But then if we don't write it down, then it's just gone. It's gone. And then days later, weeks later, whatever, we want to remember what he spoke. And because we didn't write it down, you know, we just, we don't have it. So I could only urge you, you know, as, a, as someone who grew up uh, under the uh, teaching of Pastor Jeff Johnson, you know, and just the old Calvary that constantly say, take notes, take notes, take notes. And so... That's the way I was taught, and that's what I'm going to teach. Take notes, you guys. Take notes. Especially, you know, if you're going to grow in maturity in the Word of God, as Paul is attempting to do here with the Corinth Church in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We're going to, we're going to finish off this chapter, hopefully, verses 20 through 40. And the message this morning is just simply titled, Precept Upon Precept. Precept Upon Precept. Precept basically just means that it's a general rule of general to regulate to regulate behavior or thought and immediately the 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 human nature in us right the sin nature says no one's gonna regulate me (laughs) all right well live in bondage of uh, the flesh you know have it your way live in the bondage of flesh i will do what i want when i want how i want i will say what i want but you know if you're going to be a christian if you're going to be a christian you're going to follow the ways of the lord we must submit to the teachings of the Lord through His Word, His precious Word. And He's He's given us those that are in authority, such as Paul, as an apostle, who God speaks through by the through the Holy Spirit to instruct us in this thing called the Christian faith. And and it's to correct us, it's to guide us. And ultimately, look, the Christian faith belongs to who? Belongs to God, man. God is the owner of our faith. And so as the owner of the faith, the creator of the faith, the sustainer of the faith, guess what? You know, in simple layman's terms, he gets to make the rules. He gets to make the rules of the faith. And then we get to choose through our free will whether we're going to obey, obey him or not obey him. And that's where the challenge comes in. That's the biggest challenge that we'll have in our life is whether we're going to obey God or we're not going to obey Him. Either we're going to go the ways of the Lord or we're going to go the ways of the world, you know? And and broad is the way, right, of destruction. Narrow, narrow is the path. Narrow is the path that leads to life. And so Paul, just want to pick it up here in in verse 20 because last week uh, we took a look at, you know, bringing the whole tongues thing and and uh, making sure that prophecy is the focal point and everything done through love. But here in verse 20, he picks it up and he says, Brethren, do not, do not, do not, emphasis on do not. That means do not. Don't. Do not be children in your thinking. In other words, grow up. Grow up. Time to grow up, man. You know, we can't, we can't continue behaving like little children in our way of thinking. Now, have you ever been around, you know, especially those that are now a little bit more seasoned like myself, and, and you're, then suddenly you find yourself surrounded by maybe teenagers or maybe even the 20s people, and if you spend enough time with them, maybe it's just me, but at a certain point, I just can't take it. <laughs> you know? 
I can't take what comes out of their mouth. I can't take the, 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 the thinking, their way of thinking. Because it reminds me of what? Of back when I was that way, right? And it's like, and it, it just doesn't resonate with me anymore. It, it's very still childlike. And, and though back when you were that age in your 20s, you thought you were all that, right? You know, you thought, man, my thinking is at a much higher level. Even, even as Christians, even as Christians, you could be digging the word all you want, but still the maturity, the maturity comes through what? Through experience, through experience and through submission to the Lord in what's called obedience. That's when you really know that you've, that you've arrived in, a, in, a, in, a area of, uh, in the area of maturity is, is when you're taking all that you, is before you and you begin to kick, scream, and want to hold your breath and all those things to get your way and thinking that, you know what, but I'm right, but I'm right, but I'm right. And then you let it all go and you say, but Lord, thy will. And I'm just going to do what you say. And I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to obey you with every fiber of my being. Even if it goes against every, every ounce of what my flesh is, is designed to do, I'm going to, I'm going to submit all these things, all these thoughts, and I'm going to submit them to the authority of you, Lord Jesus Christ. Because you know best. Mine is to trust and obey. But Paul exhorts, stop that. Stop your childless thinking. I mean, that's, that, that's the accusation against the Corinth church. And if you're not right with God this morning, and you're off in your own thinking, guess what? Boom, you're just as guilty. Quit being a child in your way of thinking. Yet an evil be babes. So, you know, major in the right things. Don't be so focused on what's going on in the world and so on and so forth. You know, the old teaching about, about uh, knowing the truth, about, you know, uh, special relation when, with uh, counterfeit money, that they always say that, you know what, that those that are responsible to make sure that currency is accurate and so on and so forth, they don't study the bogus stuff. They study what? The real stuff, the genuine stuff. They, they, they are intimate with what's real, with the truth. So why? So then when the counterfeit come, boom, they recognize it immediately. But if they spent all day long chasing down the counterfeit, trying to figure out what counterfeit is out there, that's exhausting. There's tons of counterfeit out there. But there's but one truth. And when you're intimate with the truth, then the counterfeit, boom, you recognize it immediately. And that's what the point that Paul is making here. Yet in evil be babes, but in your thinking be mature. So, we are called to maturity in our faith. We are called to maturity in our faith, and it's accomplished by right, godly thinking. Right, godly thinking. Patterns. The patterns. You know, regretfully, uh, you know, the, the example is kind of like, especially now in the modern days that we live in, their minds are like computers, right? And the information's inputted. Because computers are only good as the information that's inputted. Everyone thinks that computers are smart. No, it's like, come on, it's the information that's put in to the computers. Anybody knows that, you know, when you surf the web, buyer beware. You got to go out there and do the research, make sure you go on the right websites. I see it time and time again, people getting duped by, by websites that are, are satire. And they go and they repost it as though it's true. And it's like, oh my gosh, it's a satirical website that you're quoting and, and, and regurgitating. You don't know how foolish you're looking right now. If you only did the research, you would find out that it's not true. But the point is, is that there's just so much out there, but we're called to have, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the example that I was given regarding the computer, that the computer information, the information is being inputted and bogus information can be inputted. Well, that's like us, you know, that like children, sometimes when we're growing up, we get all this bogus information being input into this computer and then we think that to be right. We think that to be true. And then when we come into relationship with the truth, Jesus Christ, then all of a sudden, the, the, it becomes a challenge to our mind to take those old ways of thinking and to renew that and to put in the right way, the truth in the way of thinking. And that takes time. It takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. It just doesn't happen overnight. You'll be stretched in many areas of your life throughout the course of your life. 
All you have to do is just read the New Testament and the challenges that the, that the church had at the very beginning. Especially, especially those that were of the, of the complete faith, you know, complete total believers, which is the Jews, Jews who came to the knowledge of salvation. And then all of a sudden, when the gospel went forth and the Gentiles started coming, coming to the knowledge of salvation, and there's that conflict of like, wait a minute, we need to put them under the law. And like, we can't do that. We don't need to pull the law completely ourselves. And it went back and forth, and you see that in the book of Acts. And so they, they had to navigate through that so that their thinking was in line with what the, what the truth was teaching. That ever since the beginning, that the Jews were supposed to be a light to who? To everyone. So that all could come to the knowledge of Yahweh, of the living God. But then in their thinking of them becoming basically insulated and thinking, well, the God that we have is it's an exclusive God just for us. You know, those dirty Gentiles, they don't, they, they got nothing to do with our God. And they're wrong in their thinking. And all of a sudden, with, uh, with the Holy Spirit descending and the, the power of the Holy Spirit bringing, bringing all into the knowledge of salvation, it challenged their way of thinking, and then they had a choice to make. Either they're going to dig into their heels and stick with what they thought was the way of thinking and, and, and the patterns and the way that they should go, or they're going to yield to what was obvious and what God was showing them through what was being manifest through the Gentile. And when they came to that realization that, wait a minute, this, this has to be of God. And if it's of God, who's going to stop it? They're speaking in tongues. They're, they're glorifying God. I mean, they start, they start taking, taking into account and, and noticing all the evidence. The evidence was there. The evidence was in line with the Word of God. And then finally, they submitted themselves to what was going on or to God himself and they said hey man welcome to the family welcome to the family brethren right but these patterns that we have these old ways of thinking the old ways of reacting and behaving they need to be knocked out of us they need to be knocked out of us and God does that in a very gentle manner he's very patient with us you know but nonetheless we'll be challenged in those areas you could, you could bet on it, man. If you're a Christian, you're going to be challenged in those areas. God, God is a good father. And he's not going to allow his children that he loves so dearly to go in the, in the path, in the, in, the past, in, in the patterns of the thinking and the ways of destruction. He's going to pursue us. And he's going to put us in situations that are going to say, Think biblically. Think soberly. Think righteously. Think clearly but above all think <laughs> you know <laughs> above all think <laughs> you know <laughs> let's get get this brain engaged in your faith paul writes this in ephesians if you turn with me real quick to ephesians chapter 4 uh there in verse 14 ephesians 4:14 4, and he says what does he say? As soon as, as soon as I find out, I'll tell you what he says. Oh, in F Ephesians 4.14, 4, he says, uh, As a result, we are no longer to be children. There it is again. You know, And don't confuse this with, with the affectionate term that God uses for us. This is in relation to our behavior and our thinking. No longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves giving that picture like waves, right? Tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. So we're not to be uh, falling into those traps, into those ways of thinking. So Paul illustrates, you know, how it works. Don't go in that direction. Recognize those things. He says, but speaking the truth in love and agape, we are to grow up in all aspects, emphasis, all aspects, every single aspect, into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building of, up of itself 
in again in love or in agape. So it's like I said earlier, right? Paraphrasing here, God is the owner of the faith. He's the the head of the church. And so he's the one who controls all things. We're to follow, to follow in his teachings, in his instructions. When you put it that way, doesn't it, doesn't it just make sense? You know, when, when the Lord came to Paul, what did he tell him right away? Why are you kicking against the goad? You know? Why are you, why are you beating your head against the wall? Why are you trying to go against the flow in the sense of get right with God? You know? I mean, life is difficult enough as it is already. Just go with righteousness and truth. Going back to the text in verse 21, it says, In the law it is written by men of strange tongue, uh, strange tongues, and by the lips of strangers I will speak to this people, and even so they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So then, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers, but prophecy is a sign, is for a sign, not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. So Paul here, uh, in, in quoting um, the psalm and also too, in reference to Isaiah, you know, back in the days of uh, the Israelites, remember, you know, the Lord leads them out of Egypt, takes them to the desert. He gets, gets the Israelites reacquainted with himself because remember at the beginning when, when, uh, uh, when Moses said to the Lord, well, I'm going to go, but who do I say send me? He says, I am, I am that I am. You know, and so in the desert they go out, and it's time to get reacquainted because for over the uh, four hundred some odd years that they were in captivity, they fell into the pattern of the thinking of the ways of the world, which is a symbolic. Egypt is symbolic of the world, doing things the ways of the world, behaving the world's way. There in in the desert, the Lord says, "Hey, here I am. I'm the Lord. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to I'm going to give you shade by day." The fire by night. I'm going to take care of your clothing. I'm going to take care of your life. I'm going to take care of every aspect. I want you to know who I am, you know, and and we're going to have intimacy out here in the desert. And so it began. They saw signs. They saw wonders. They heard the word, so on and so forth. They crossed the the uh, uh, they crossed the Red Sea on the other side. They have a dance off, a sing off, woohoo, you know. And then they go into the land. And then slowly but surely, what happens? They leave the Lord behind. Why? Because they stopped listening. They stopped listening. And then basically they became, they became rebellious and, and, and to a point really as, as Israel is today, very secular. Secular in their thinking. Worldly in their thinking. And then guess what? As it was prophesied there in Deuteronomy 28, then all of a sudden the foreigners, the Assyrians came in and they ruled over them in foreign tongues and all of a sudden basically the tongues was as a sign to saying what's up what's going on here what happened to us what what you know is, is, god where are you all of a sudden what it quickens the spirit doesn't it it quickens the spirit like i said the israelites became immature they became immature in their way of thinking when they stopped listening to god and then the foreigners come in. And there's a, a wake-up call. And really God, as, as Paul is illustrating here, you know, he makes a comparison. Because again, the theme is still tongues and prophecy, the proper use and so on and so forth. Because he's eventually going to go into the teaching of precept upon precept. The rules, so to speak. To regulate. But he says, tongues was used, the foreign tongues were used to provoke to provoke and stimulate to the Jews within them to say what's going on here there's something up with this man we've gone terribly wrong you know uh, is, is God trying is God trying to tell us something because mind you in the tongues that were being sp spoken the foreigners guess what is barbaric they have no idea what they're saying so when you do the comparison as far as what Paul says about tongues, right? If there's no interpretation, it's barbaric and you're going like, what's going on? We know something's going on. 
We know this isn't like a natural thing that's going on and it, it provokes, it provokes and stimulates curiosity. But how effective is it? Because it's going to go one way or the other. He's going to talk about that. It's going to go one way or the other. It's going to say, hey, we want to know more or it's just going to be dismissed as just, this is just wacky and all of you are wacky and we're just moving on with our life. So it's generally to provoke because again, Paul is here in relation to believers. To believers. Stimulation of our faith is a fabulous thing, isn't it? We need it. We need encouragement. We need stimulation. Because we go through dry times. And, and God uses you know ministerial work. He uses obviously the teaching of the word. He uses people in your lives, other Christians, to exhort and encourage you and stimulate you in the things of God. But also, too, he uses the gifts. He uses gifts to stimulate us to a higher level of maturity. To find out, how do we obtain those gifts if you don't know how? What are the gifts for? To even basically say, I want gifts. Hey, I want to be used in that manner. See the stimulation that occurs? It provokes us. It provokes us and stimulates us to ask questions. Those that say that you shouldn't ask questions, you know, shouldn't ask questions uh, of, of God or from God, that's nonsense. I mean, questions are good, man. Questions are good. Especially, like I said, the biggest one to ask is what's going on here? What's the haps? Where am I in all this? Where's my walk with the Lord? I mean, these are some real good, real good questions when you bring it to the personal manner. Where am I in my walk with with the Lord, in my service to the Lord, in my submission, in my obedience, in, in, my, in my service. Where? Where? These are good questions to ask consistently, daily, you know? We, we shouldn't save those questions only in crisis mode, which generally a lot of us, that's what we end up doing. We wait till the crisis arrives at our doorstep, or worse yet, is in the home. I'll take a crisis outside my door any day. <laughs> yeah? Amen? I mean, wouldn't you agree? Hey, crisis outside my door? Okay. Cool. You know, I should have been better prepared. But when it's in my home, whoa. And I'm caught off guard, woe unto me. You know? Woe unto me that I was caught off guard. But when I'm asking those stimulating questions in regards to my own walk, in my own faith, in my own obedience, it causes that proper stimulation to keep me in line with the Word of God and to continue what? Digging into the Word of God. Seeking. Seek Him while He still may be found. Seek Him. You know, a lot of us as Christians, we say, oh yeah, that's for the non-believer. Is it really? You know, it's for all of us. Seek Him while He still may be found, you know? And so... To provoke. And that's the message right here. You know, Paul's teeing it up. He's teeing it up. He, he's so eloquent, isn't he? He's so lovingly eloquent with, 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 his, with his spiritual children. He doesn't, he doesn't want to come in and just bring in a sledgehammer. He's bringing in, a, it's very thought-provoking. Don't be children. Don't focus on the evil. Focus on maturity. Hey, listen, just like in the days of old, which, which by the way, when, just by that statement itself, is implying what? If he's quoting days of old, what's he implying? That they know about it. <laughs> that they've studied about it. These Gentiles know about the ways of old that happened to the Jews, right? And so it's very thought-provoking. And then he, he, he wants to stimulate again that, that internal spiritual gut check. And he says in verse 23... If therefore the whole church should assemble together and all speak in tongues and ungifted men, those are the, those are the uh, Christians, ungifted men. And when he says men, we're talking about just non-gender but humans, okay? Or unbelievers enter. So that's, that's you have the scenario, okay? So people come to church. 
and now seated, they enter in, believers as well as uh, uh, unbelievers, and everyone speaking in tongues, will they not say that you are mad? Again, very thought-provoking here, you know, and an extreme, very extreme. Either you're sane or you're mad. <laughs> There's like no in-between. Either you're or, uh, orderly or, hey, complete chaos. Either, either you're truly walking and giving the appearance of and sounding like, or you're just whacked out, you know? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed and he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. Paul here uses a fictitious individual that decides to come to church one day. And we know that's no coinkydinky. Wooed by the Spirit of God. Maybe this individual has received invitation after invitation. Maybe, maybe as they're eating the kettle corn, they see the, 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 the flyer that says, Come, join us. And they, they're, they're, they're like, You know what? This kettle corn's good. I wonder if they have more. I'm going to go. You know? <laughs> Whatever God uses to say, Hey, come. You know? And, and then now they're sitting here and they're listening to the prophetic word, the word of God just being taught simply and it brings this unusual never experienced before conviction in their heart that they're just like man I don't know it feels like even as though this God he's referring to and talking about is talking directly to me just to me as though as though nobody else is here it's just me and I'm beginning to feel extremely uncomfortable in the fact that you know what all these things like I like I, I feel immense guilt upon me and that you know what that I need to get right with this God and we know what it is it's the power of the Holy Spirit it convicts it convicts all men of sin and it's the work of God through this simplistic teaching of the word and it falls upon you know just like when Peter was teaching it fell upon the Gentiles and the word says man before he can even finish you know the Holy, there's a Holy Spirit fire break out right and they start worshiping God speaking in tongues and he wasn't even done the conviction was that heavy and you know what hey if you're convicted of your sin that's a good thing a, a lot of people you know they're deceived by the ways of the world and the devil himself. And when they start feeling convicted about their wrongdoing, about their sin, they say, hey, man, you're just trying to make me feel, I'm feeling guilty right now. And, and it, that's a good thing because what? You know what? You are guilty in the eyes of God. We all are guilty in the eyes of God. But Paul, like it says, uses this, this fictitious individual. And then all of a sudden, because he hears the prophecy, whether, whether it's taught from the pulpit or in an, in an afterglow or whatever the case may be, the conviction comes upon them and they get saved. And that's the main thing. That's the main thing. The, the brother on the cross, the thief. I'm not talking about Jesus. I'm talking about the thief. How much tongues did he speak? <laughs> that brother didn't even get water baptized. You know? He didn't get water baptized. He didn't even go on a mission trip. He, he didn't get into a program. You know? He, he didn't get vetted for ministry. He was like, today. The Lord said, today, today, okay, which is when? Today, you will be with me in paradise. You need speaking tongues. You don't even have doctrinal understanding, theological explanation. You, you don't need to break out in a hallelujah dance. You can't. You're pinned to a cross along with me. But today, because you have confessed and you put your trust, your belief, you have repented. Jesus sends that repentance in this man, this thief who is guilty as charged. Murderous man, you know. Why do I say this? Do I know exactly what this charge is? Well, Jesus says you hate your brother. You know, you got murder in your heart. 
That man even turned on his own brothers on the cross. He turned against his own people. That's why he was charged, you know, guilty on the cross. But in spite of all that, he sensed that there's repentance of all that. Today, you will be with me in paradise. That's it. Done deal. But yet again, we make it complicated. Complicated, you know? I'm a simplistic man. I really am. I love, I, you know, that's probably the biggest part of the, of the faith that I love most is God is so simple. Just love me. Receive me. You receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit does work. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm a man who, who who's a, you know, procrastinates, who by nature is lazy. And so I could, I could shift it over to the Holy Spirit and say, you do the work in me. And guess what? He does. He does. That's the beauty of the faith. The simplicity of the faith. But if I were to turn around and say, oh, I'm going to do this. I, I'm going to learn it all. I'm going to make sure that, you know, that, that, that uh, you know, I fulfill all these things that are written out. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to make it so complicated. Because then my eyes are no longer in Jesus, the author and perfect of my faith. They're on who? They're on me. They're on me. And, and everybody else. You know? Make sure I say the right things, do the right things, you know? All those things instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to do the work in me and through me. And then ultimately, so the Lord receives all the credit. So I don't boast in myself, but I boast in Christ Jesus. So point is here in these verses Paul is saying the most effective means of instruction and conversion is through the teaching of the word of God it's the most effective means it's the most effective means just give the word and you'll see greater results as a matter of fact um, you know again Paul extrapolates his examples to the continuity of the word so he's not just pulling stuff out of, out of thin air, so to speak. It's biblical. Think about Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, there in, in chapter 2. Remember? What happens? There's a dream. And, and Nebuchadnezzar's all wigged out about the dream. And, you know, there's men that supposedly come. And, and the first thing they say is, hey, uh, well, King, tell me about the No, no, I'm going to tell you nothing. You're supposed to be the ones that are supposed to know about these things. You tell me what happened. And then, so eventually, what happens? They bring Daniel, who's the interpreter of dreams. And he comes back, right? And lays it down and interprets a dream and tells Nebuchadnezzar exactly, hey, this is what this means. This is that statue you saw. Ultimately, it's your demise. <laughs> you know, not my words, <laughs> not my plan. Take it up with him, okay? But he lays it down and then eventually... Nebuchadnezzar, you know, there in, in Daniel uh, chapter 2 and verse 48, what's he ultimately uh, acknowledge? Your God is the God of gods. Your God is the God of gods. Pre interpretation, he wasn't proclaiming that because it was what? Barbaric to his ears, basically. He was like, huh? I, don't, I have no idea what this dream is all about, but it's troubling me to the point where I can't even sleep. But when it was interpreted and given the translation and the prophetic word from God's, from God's mouth to the ears of Daniel and his heart, and then the interpretation, the king says, your God is the God of gods. And that's powerful, you know? Because how many in the world don't say that? It's like, well, why is your God so special? Aren't all gods the same? Isn't it the same God? And we know from a biblical standpoint, that's not true. That is not true. The, the God of Islam is not the God of the Bible. He's not. It, it's complete uh, polar opposites, you know? And, and the list goes on and on. I mean, you know, the isms of this world, even, even uh, you know, uh, meditation and so on and so forth. Oh, we're meditating the same God. No, you're not. It's a created God. There's only but one God. Triunity, but one God. And it's revealed, like I said, through the, the, the teaching of the Word. And when people come to that 
spiritual birth or that aha moment, as we say in the natural, all of a sudden what do they start doing? They start worshiping the true God, the God of the Bible. Look at verse 26, because here's, here's where he starts to kind of, you know, he, he does the front end work, you know? Any of you who are, are in, um, any of you who want to learn anything about leadership and leading people, this is, this is, this is prime stuff right here, because Paul, Paul sets a foundation first. He does a wonderful job of explaining things so that the audience that he's speaking to has a clear understanding about what he's talking about. And once they have that, once he's laid that out, then he's able to give the instruction about precepts of precepts or the regulatory uh, aspect of it as far as behavior and thought, which he says, what is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble... Each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. So, though all are free to participate, because that's basically what he's saying here. All are free to participate. Everyone. As, as children of God, we all... Jesus said himself, he who the Son has set free is free indeed. Indeed of what? Or free of what? Well, free from the bondage of sin, but also too, never, I, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but you're also free to join in the participation in the kingdom doing. And all that is included within the kingdom, you're free to move around. <laughs> or to move about, I think they say, you know? So, in spiritual terms, free from sin, the bondage of sin, the ways of the world, and also, simultaneously, free now to participate in the things of God. Freely. Freely, you have what? Received. Freely, give. Okay? We can't, we can't give. You ever thought about it? We can't give salvation. So, it's not referring to salvation. It's referring to the gifts that come along with salvation, the freedom to exercise our our relationship with the living God. And so Paul says, everyone's invited, everyone's free to participate. However, all should submit to the precepts that accompany free participation. Well, I was talking to a friend yesterday. It's not the first time I've talked to a friend, okay? <laughs> so anyone wondering, is it for the first time you ever talked to a friend? Yesterday I was talking to a friend who just came back from Romania and he was sharing about his time there and so on and so forth. He went to go see family and he began to share regarding uh, the culture. The culture basically of, of uh, the aftermath of wars and, and revolutions and the breaking away from communism and so on and so forth. And, and you know, uh, Romania for, for the most part is a third world country. And uh, the, the capital though is, um, can't remember off the top of my head. So anyway, uh, you guys can look it up later, okay? Don't, you know, this, is, this isn't the geographical uh, uh, lesson this morning. It's storytelling right now. So back to my story. So he begins to share that as a result, you know, that, that people for the most part there are kind of laid back. But he's beginning to share regarding driving and just, just navigating through the towns and so on and so forth. He says, there are no rules. There's no rules. Which, you know, when there's no rules, guess what? That is the rule. <laughs> When, no matter what, you can't get around rules. If you agree there's going to be no rules, you've agreed to the rule of no rules. And so that rule is going to rule your life. And that rule of no rules is called chaos. It's called chaos. And so he was sharing that, you know what? It, it's just chaos there. No, no base, nothing. It, everyone just, especially talking about driving, uh, people honk, go around you, they're impatient. You know, stoplights and all that stuff mean absolutely nothing. But yet, I shared... Well, what's the difference here? In the sense that, you know what? We're people. Uh, we're, we're, we're human, just like they're human. The only difference, though, here, and this is so powerful. Think about this, you guys. The power and the beauty of our society, for the most part, is that we agree 
we agree collectively that we will obey. That's it. And thus, we have the order that we have. Thus, people stop. Again, generally, for the most part, at red lights. People drive the speeds they drive. People do the things that we do as a society because we agree. If tomorrow or even, you know, at let's say 2 o'clock today, we officially, collectively as a society, will no longer agree, no one stops us. Nobody could stop us. Absolutely nobody. I don't care how much law enforcement's out there. I can guarantee you law enforcement would say like, uh, everyone's agreed to live in chaos. For that reason, we're out. I didn't go out there and try to regulate that. You can't. Law enforcement works because we agree to obey when they were approached by law enforcement. Whether it's the lights blinking, you know, flashing behind them, we agree to stop. We agree. It's not by force. We agree. Those that don't take off and then eventually, <laughs> if they're caught, then they are subjected to agree whether they like it or not, you know? And that's the beauty that is so I'm, I'm talking, it is powerful. You don't even understand how powerful that is to have agreement. That's why the Bible teaches where, where you know, if two do not agree, how can they walk together? And so it's, it's just the, the chaos in society is illustrated through the scriptures. If, if we just, as a society, would study just that, hey, we first got to agree. And what's the first thing we got to agree to? It's to not kill each other when we, don't, when we don't agree. It's as simple as that. That everyone has a right to an opinion, a right to thought, and then we can walk together. But because we don't agree to that, oh my gosh, people go crazy, you know? But it's powerful. And when you bring it within the church, because that's where I want to bring it, that's what Paul's talking about here. An agreement that if you're going to participate, if you're going to participate in, in the activities within the church that have been given to you freely, actually we have an obligation under the Lord to agree to the precepts upon precepts that have been laid out before us through His Word. That brings in edification. That brings in order. That brings in glory to the name of the Lord. All of life has order. A society, like I said, without agreed order is a, is a society in chaos. And actually, when you live like that, bondage comes in. Did you know that when you go against the Lord, you're just living in bondage, man? What bondage are you living in? The bondage of sin and rebellion? You're no longer in liberty. You're living in bondage. The ways of the the ways of the of the of the, of the Lord, you know, His are what prosperity, success. You know, don't lean on your understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways. He'll lead you in the ways of everlasting. He'll lead you by the by the still waters and so on and so forth. He He will make you lay down in the green pastures. You know what that means that when heavy stuff comes your way and you say, Lord, help me deal with it. He says, I'm gonna make you lay down. You need to take a little time out so I could deal with you, you know? And we yield to the Lord. But the moment that we don't yield to the Lord, we're right back in the bondage, in the chaos of life, in the chaos, you know, that ensues through rebellion and disobedience. Now, hmm, I'm a little time challenged here. If anyone speaks, verse 27, if anyone speaks in tongues, or sorry, in a tongue, if anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at the most three, and each in turn, and let one interpret. You know what that is? That's a precept. So it's almost like, you know, if you're like to go to the, go online and say, you know what, I want to purchase a book on the rules of speaking in tongues, you'd find this verse. <laughs> It'd be right here. It, it, that, that would be in the book. 
So we gather at a church and say, you know what? Hey, some of you may have the gift of tongues. Some of you may not. I guess we're about to find out. You know, this is not during the church service. Obviously, this is, you know, after church service, where the case may be, in what we call now the afterglow. And they say, okay, cool. Well, you know what? And all of a sudden, you know, 10 people start speaking in tongues. Guess what? The leader at that juncture should say, hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, it can't be that way. That's not order. That's not, that's not the proper precepts, you know? That's not the, the proper rules to regulate our behavior, our thought, okay? We'd say, hey, according to the scriptures, and this is how it works. Look, like I said, it's real simple. They said, well, then what should we be doing? And then we say, well, according to verse 27 in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, the Bible says, if anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or three at the most. Okay, so which, which two or three are going to go first? And then all of a sudden, all ten still say, no, we all want to do it at the same time. Then we're not doing it. Finito, done. It, it, it's done. They go, well, who, who made you king? I'm not king. I'm just telling you what the word says. You're being disobedient. Are, are we going to submit together or not? It's, seriously, that's how it works. And then, and then you go on and say, and each in turn. So it's, even you select three, and it's not three at the same time. It's you go first. Okay, how that you want to do that? Whoever wants to go first, a rock, paper, scissors, I don't care. Okay? Draw straws, pick numbers, whatever. But you take turns. And each in turn, and let one interpret. So this tells us what? That out of the three... One of them should have the gift of interpretation. And again, it, it, if, there's, if there's no one to interpret amongst those three, guess what? Right? Guess where we're at again? Right back to, then we're not doing it. We're not doing it. Anyone who goes against this is being disobedient and is not in it for the edification of the church, but is in it for themselves. They're like, oh man, well, you know, I, I, invite, I invited a lot of my church family because I told them tonight was the night to speak tongues. Yeah. Really? <laughs> hey, look, you're saying a pastor, come on, that's a pretty bad example. Is it really? I don't think so. That happens, you guys. That happens. The flesh creeps in. It's no longer about the edification of the church, glorifying God. It's all about my opportunity to shine, my opportunity to show off gifts, my opportunity to get accolades and get the attaboys, promotion within it, or whatever, whatever the motives, whatever the reasons. And then when that plan gets foiled, so to speak, by God himself through his word, oh man, you will know. You will, you will know right away, you know, where that heart truly was to begin with. Because if your heart is right with God and is being done in love and you're one of those three that, you know, has that gift and we can't align it with the Word of God and, and all of a sudden we're shutting it down, I would hope and pray that you're, you are the first one to say, Praise the Lord. Because my desire is to bring glory to God. And clearly, by His Word, God doesn't want this to happen. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's the old... Uh, you know, a lot of people always ask, I just desperately want to know what the will of God is in my life. I desperately want to know. I desperately want to know. How often do you read his word? It's been a while. <laughs> I'm like, really? Well, if you just cracked open his word, you would know what the will of is for your life. The, the, basic, the basic, most basic of, of wills for your life, according to, you know, for, uh, that God has for your life, is simply this. Obey him. That's it. All the days of your life. Obey Him all the days of your life. And how do you find out how to obey Him? is by opening up His Word. Think about it in this manner, and we'll end here. Because I want to be time sensitive. I'm trying to be like a new pastor, okay? Reinvent myself in more in a timely manner. And it's, it's not easy, you know? But I'm going to do it. Think about this. You know, uh, hey, the World Cup just ended today. <laughs> I'm, hey, I'm bummed, okay? 
I'm gonna I'm be I'm gonna be 56 the next time it comes around. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and then by the time it comes to the United States, I don't even want to talk about it. I'll be 60. Oh, I won't see the World Cup here until I'm 60. I measure my life by World Cups. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, the World Cup just came, just ended today, right? Or think about your your favorite sport or your favorite activity. I don't care what it is. They have precept upon precept. They have precept upon precept. And if they don't obey the precept upon precept, it's mass chaos. It, it's, it ceases being what it is. You can't say, hey, uh, we'll take football and say, hey, you know what, oh, Monday night football or Thursday night and we're going to watch the game, pick your teams, you're going to go at it. And at the beginning of the game, both teams hit the field and they agree, you know what, we're not going to obey the rules of the, of the game. We're going to do what we want. And the, as you as a fan, what are you going to do? You're going to go like, this is ridiculous. Follow the rules, man. Follow the rules. Because if not, it's not in the game. What are, you're going to sit there and ask, what are you playing? Yeah. Are you not? I mean, come on. You're going to ask, what are you playing? That's not the game. What are you basing on? The precepts upon the precepts. But, but because they agree. They don't come out before the game and go, hey, man. We can agree to obey the rules of the game. They don't do that. It's just mutually accepted in faith that they're going to agree to the rules of the game. And they're going to have the umpires, you know, regulating the precepts upon precepts. And it keeps the things in order. And guess what? In that manner, everyone enjoys, except the losers. <laughs> but even then, it's like, hey, we lost... When you lose, what do you, how do you like to lose? No one likes to lose, but I'm just saying, when it happens, generally, when it happens, you like to say what? We lost fairly. It was just that the other team was just way better, that we had our opportunities, but because of the precepts and the precepts were obeyed, we lost fairly. But when those precepts aren't followed, oh, man, conspiracy theories all over the place, man, you know? Yeah, that bad umpire, he's he he that ref, man, he was in for them, or the league won just to stretch this or that. It's like, oh, stop it, you know? Your team just lost, accept it. <laughs> but the point is, is that, you know, we expect that in the natural. We expect people to obey precept upon precept in the natural. So why, why in, as Christians, would we not clamor for it spiritually clamor for precept upon precept obedience within the church instead we have division by saying oh no we do it this way we do it that way we believe that this is a must or else you're not saved we believe that on this day it has to be because if not ditto and it's like that's not precept upon precept, man. You got rules of regulation that you've made up. And just like the example I gave about football and you're not following the rules, it ain't the same game anymore, guess what? You ain't playing the same spiritual game anymore. I don't know what you're doing. You're doing your own thing. And that's not what the Bible teaches. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity to to really Lord you know this is this is deep correction by Paul here inspired by you Holy Spirit to get us in line and you know you're not going to force anyone you're going to twist any arms you're going to us free will however though if we're going to obey you this comes with the territory and I would hope that our response wouldn't be out of like well, you know, I'm only going to do it because you are God. Begut begrudgingly and, and just with a bad attitude. But that our hearts would be right. And it would be in, in genuine response to your love for us. In thankfulness to say, you know, Lord, I was lost. 
my life was chaos and I was in complete bondage before you came into my life. And you stooped and you reached down to the lowest of the low to rescue me out of that darkness and my sinfulness, Lord God, which was just destroying me. And you didn't have to. But because you love me, you did so. You extended your amazing grace to me. And my life is immensely richer and better as a result of it. I'm saved. I have purpose. I have direction. I have your love. I have your blessings within me and surrounding me. You go with me all the days of my life. You provide for me, Lord God, even, even when I'm faith, faithless, Lord God, and, and questioning just your presence. And so the least that I can do, Lord God, is live for you properly and yield the totality of my life to your ways. Being humbled before you, being transparent, allowing for you to deal even with my brain, knocking out those things and those patterns that are not of you. You have your precepts upon precept to regulate how your church should function, how I'm to bear fruit in the maximum way possible. I desire that, Lord God. Forgive me of my disobedience. Forgive me of my ways instead of living for your ways. Forgive me, Lord God, for making it about me and forgetting that it's all about you but it it's reset just like you want us to live precept by precept we do it by resetting resetting our priorities resetting our eyes upon you resetting our attitude resetting our hearts resetting everything within us Lord to be in line with you. May your Holy Spirit fall upon this place on each countenance, Lord God, on each life, and that, Lord, that you would be pleased by the faith that we exhibit. And we ask these things in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>